that's, yeah. that's something that I really emphasize is, you know, how, how can people become their own guru, doctor guru, like be the doctor of your own body, because you know your body best, you know it better than anybody else. Hey, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Reshape Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Vincent Pedre, and he is a medical doctor and the medical director of the Pedre Integrative Health and founder of Dr. Pedre Wellness. He is the CEO and founder of Happy Gut Life. He's worked as a nutraceutical consultant and spokesperson for Nature MD and orthomolecular products, and he is a functional medicine certified practitioner. He has a concierge practice in New York City, and he's done that since 2004. And he believes that the gut is a gateway to excellent wellness. We've been talking a lot about gut health on this podcast, so I think that this interview will dive deeper into some aspects that we haven't covered yet. Um, his newest book, The Gut Smart Protocol, features a 14-day personalized gut healing plan based on the Gut Smart Quiz. And it's the culmination of years of research and clinical experience as a functional gut health expert. Dr. Pedre, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to not only get to hear your story about dealing with irritable bowel syndrome, but we're going to dive deeper into the gut brain connection today. That's going to be the central focus of this is how is our, how does our gut health connect to our mental health, anxiety, depression. We're going to dive deep into the physiology um, and really talk about ways that people can improve their mental health by improving their gut health and vice versa. So thank you for joining us. Let's get started. Just share your story a little bit about yourself um, and your experience with irritable bowel syndrome. Well, first off, it's a pleasure being here and thank you so much for having me on yeah. your podcast. Um, this was an issue that I grew up with since I can remember since I was a little kid, had a nervous stomach. I felt a lot of things in my digestive system. And um, I remember actually um, some of my earliest memories were suffering from severe constipation, like to the point that I was in tears because I wanted to go to the bathroom, but I just couldn't. Um, and I remember just like my mom doing home remedies for that. Uh, but somewhere around the age of 10, you know, just like any kid, I started getting sick and you get sore throats, you get uh, sinusitis, you get pneumonia or, or bronchitis. And they would take me to the doctor and they would give me antibiotics. And then I would get sick again and they would take me to the doctor and they would give me antibiotics again. And I've calculated that I was on 20 plus rounds of antibiotics from the year, from the age of 10 until about 19 years old. And if you can imagine what antibiotics do to the gut, they decimate the gut microbiome. And two to three rounds of antibiotics was not allowing my gut microbiome to recover. And as a result, that's why I kept getting sick. It made my immune system mm. weaker and weaker because the gut is the biggest presence of your immune system, like 70 to 80% of your immune system is all along the gut lining. And it's very critical that that part of your immune system is in homeostasis or balance. And when you're going in with antibiotics and you're taking away those good bacteria, because antibiotics kill both good and bad bacteria. So when you're going in and you're killing off the good bacteria, you're actually affecting the gut barrier. And it took me over two decades to figure this out. You know, so as, as I went through my teenage years, it became more like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, now not constipation, running to the bathroom, feeling sick in my stomach before tests, whenever I had any stressful thing. And I was also eating the two biggest food groups that later on I learned were hugely prob problematic for me because I had developed sensitivities to these food groups. One was gluten and the other one was milk. And a day for me as a teenager could start with cereal with milk in the morning, then a sandwich with bread for lunch, a milkshake, on the way home from school because my mom loved and I loved vanilla milkshakes and I was starving by the time she picked me up. So she would take me to one of those fast food restaurants, maybe Burger King, 
and get a milkshake, vanilla milkshake on the way home was like the best thing. And then dinner, and what, what did I have for dessert? I had ice cream, and yet I kept getting sick over and over. So I had developed sensitivity to these foods. I had leaky gut, and lit, little did I know this was going on. And as I trained as a doctor and then went into residency, I found myself really struggling with energy. Like mm -hmm. I didn't feel well. Um, and I thought it was the 24 hour shifts, the working hundred hour work weeks. I thought that that's why I didn't feel well. And he's not over-exaggerating, mind you. No. I have a brother in um, a fellowship for plastic surgery. He's not over-exaggerating when they're saying 20 hour shift, hundred hour work weeks. Yeah. 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 So, so you can easily attribute not feeling well to that. But I would come home and I was, you know, typical, you know, doctor in training. So maybe I had a frozen meal that I heated up after I had been on call for 24 hours and you get home and you're starving, you feel horrible. I was half nauseous, half hungry, and I knew I needed something in my belly. And yet I didn't realize that I just kept poisoning myself with the foods I was choosing and it wasn't until I discovered functional medicine, started learning about the gut microbiome and the gut and this thing called leaky gut, like something that we never, ever were trained in in medical school. We, we learned sepsis, what happens when your blood vessels become leaky when you have an overwhelming infection. So we knew the extreme uh, version of internal body leakiness, but the concept of leaky gut is not taught in, or at least this is 20 plus years ago. So you can see my grays. I'm a, yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit dated now. So this wasn't something that was taught. And, and so it took me relearning medicine as a functional medicine practitioner to really fully understand what was going on with me. And I started changing my diet. I took gluten out. I actually did a blood test that showed that I had a gluten sensitivity. And so, and I kind of being sort of a doctor that works between, you know, medicine is an art, but it's also a data science. And really true medicine is, is the, the merger of data and art, you know, cause part of it is intuition. Part of it is understanding processes in the body, how the body works. And part of it is, is taking data and filtering it and saying, okay, we know not always, the data isn't always perfect, but the data is helpful. And for me, taking gluten out of the diet felt like something pretty big. I mean, I grew up with bread, like all sorts of pasta. Like this was part of what you thought is just the normal way to eat. Mm -hmm. So to think, to actually think that I was going to change my diet this way was a huge paradigm shift from not only the way I was raised, but the way that society has normalized eating this way. I mean, when I was in the hospital and training, a typical lunch that was provided during a lunchtime lecture was pizza and soda. Yep. I mean, to the, if I were to go back in time, I would say like, this is super unhealthy. It's going to make my sugar like go up and then it's going to crash. I'm going to feel horrible. I'm going to want to take a nap and I'm going to be struggling to keep my eyes open, which is inevitably what happened. But little did I know also was causing inflammation in my body because I had leaky gut and I was sensitive to gluten and dairy. And so I took these foods out of my diet and the first transformation happened within two weeks. By then I was in my private practice. I had my own clinic. I was seeing patients, um, you know, working a 12 hour day, some days a week. And when you're, when you're working with people, the person at the end of the day, isn't going to care that you're tired. You need to be as on your game at 5 PM as you were at nine in the morning. And I wasn't when I was having a sandwich for lunch, when I was having a slice of pizza, when I was exposing myself to gluten, dairy. And there were some other foods too, but those were like the main culprits. And so when I took them out within two weeks, my mental clarity, my energy at four or 5 PM, 
I started feeling as sharp as I did at the beginning of the day. And I knew I was on to something. And at that point, I decided I'm going to do this for three months and then I'm going to test out. And at three months, we were out to brunch and I used to love rye bread. So I'm like, I'm going to get a side of rye toast. It's been three months. I've been super good. Haven't had a touch of gluten. We, we became a gluten-free household. And within 10 minutes of having the bread, my wrist here on the inside develops a very faint red rash and gets itchy. And I think, you know, being always being kind of the data observer, like, and something that I really work on with people is like teaching them to be their own doctor, to listen to their bodies, because the body gives you messages. But if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss that message. You know, I had never had a slightly red rash with itchiness on the inside of my wrist. I thought, okay, that's interesting. I wonder if this is because I just had rye toast and it happened within 10 to 15 minutes, you know, and body works in mysterious ways. You know, some reactions, the body's going to tell you really quickly. And what I've learned since then, now I can tell you, because I went gluten-free in 2007. So that's now over 15 years. Um, the body can tell you, can give you a message within minutes. Some reactions are super fast. And it wasn't an allergy. I wouldn't say it was an allergic reaction, but it was some sort of immunological reaction. So, so I say, okay, I'm committed three more months, six months, I'm going to test again. Same thing. Hmm. Red rash gets slightly itchy on the inside of, of the wrist. And at that point I say, okay, this is not coincidence. Now it's happened twice, happened the same way when I had rye toast at brunch, same thing. So, you know, another thing that I try to teach people when it comes to understanding their gut is recognizing patterns. You know, seeing when you see something repeat, but also understanding that the pattern doesn't have to be precise. You know, there might have been maybe if I had had it one more time in between, it might not have happened as extreme. You know, so it's more about seeing like what happens more often than not. And then you pick up on those patterns. Right. So at that point, I'm feeling great. Six months in, I actually feel even better than I did two weeks after I stopped gluten. And the, the incredible thing about this journey is that you think like, oh, you're going to feel the full effects within four weeks. No, at six months, I felt different. At, at one year, I felt even better. And at that point, I tested again, same thing, because <laughs> I went to six months and then I went another six months. So I, I'm like, okay, I'll test in a year. And it continued happening. Uh, but what also happened during this time is it fueled my interest in the gut, the gut microbiome. And I became really curious when patients came in complaining about gut issues and migraines, or they had a gut issue and they had allergies, or they had a gut issue and they kept getting sinus infections and they went to their ENT and they kept uh, being put on antibiotics, or they were a woman with yeast infections who kept being put on antifungals. Um, and before that, she had had repetitive UTIs for which she was put on antibiotics, and now she can't get, her, get rid of the yeast infection. So I became really curious about this. And I think because the gut was always in medical school, kind of the more mysterious thing. It was, I think it was a very underrated organ system, Yeah, yeah. but also a system that if you have IBS, okay, we're going to give you antispasmodic medication. Again, Band-Aid to treat a symptom, but not the true underlying cause. Or if you, you've got constipation, we're going to give you remedy for that IBS with constipation or IBS with diarrhea, but is it wasn't really looking at, or, get, or we're going to give you an antidepressant if you have IBS, it wasn't looking at, well, why? Why might these remedies work? And what is really going on underneath? And so I started working with patients on their gut. And as we worked on gut health issues, they would come in and tell me this first year that I don't have allergies this spring. Hmm. Or my migraine frequency has dropped by 50%. And I became really fascinated with it. 
And that's kind of what led me to write my first book and now my second book, which is back there somewhere. <laughs> and um, I just became super passionate about the gut because I think it's the cornerstone of our health. It's the foundation for everything. And there's so many interconnections with other aspects of our health that have to do with the gut and the gut microbiome. And it's super fascinating, all the things that we're discovering about how the microbiome is almost like a puppeteer pulling the strings and actually controlling a lot of processes inside the body that previously we just didn't give credence to, or we didn't have the research. We weren't interested in it. You can't necessarily, you know, come up with a drug that's going to do that. But now we're understanding a lot of the metabolic pathways and, and what is it that influences the microbiome with postbiotics, the, the metabolites created by the microbiome that then affect us in all different sorts of way. Like in, I know you like to talk about insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity, but also affecting the brain as well. So it just became such a such a vast topic that felt so right to me because I was kind of like my number one gut patient. Yeah. It was my, my journey that inspired me to help others. And then realize that there wasn't a book out there that quite addressed the issues the way I wanted to address them. And that was the inspiration for writing my first, first book. And as crazy it is, as it is, I stayed in it and decided, you know, I'm going to refine this even more. And that was the inspiration for my second book is taking everything that I've learned and the updated research and um, creating a whole new protocol for people to follow. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the microbiome. Um, you said that antibiotics can really wipe it out. Um, I've heard also that when a woman goes through menopause, her gut microbiome can change and she might develop food sensitivities that she didn't have before menopause. Um, I'd like you to speak a little bit more on that. And then if you can think of any other times in a person's life where their gut microbiome might change and they might develop a new food sensitivity that you can think of off the top of your head. Yeah. Well, first, very important to understand that the, we are not born with the microbiome, right? The microbiome is something that we acquire and the first step of acquiring that microbiome is when the baby is birthed and passes through the vaginal canal and picks up the bacteria that the mom has inside the vagina. And that's a very important first colonization that happens. And we've learned that it's so important that C-section babies don't get that. They instead oh. will get colonized by the, the microbiome of the skin. And it's not as helpful so one practice that some gynecologists have started doing is taking a sterile gauze for C-section baby and putting it into the vagina, then having, you know, get those vaginal secretions with the, the, the microbiome of the vagina and then washing it over the baby that was just okay. born via C-section. And that's actually something that moms who are, who are scheduled for C-sections should really start asking their gynecologist to do because it's such an easy thing to do as soon as the baby is born, you know, douse them with that very important microbiome. Then the second step in the, the maturation or the evolution of a microbiome happens while the baby is breastfeeding. And part of that is because in breast milk, there are these HMOs, human uh, milk oligosaccharides, and they're very important sugars, short chain carbohydrates that help the colonization of the gut by a very important bacteria, it's called Bifidobacterium infantis. And that is the predominant first bacteria that lives in the gut and it's being promoted by the breast milk. And that's why it's so important to, to breastfeed and why um, breast uh, milk or breast uh, feeding formulations now have included HMOs because they've realized what an important prebiotic it is that helps support the growth of very important bacteria that is part of the development of the, of the baby. And then within the first three to five years, the, the child's microbiome is evolving. It's getting exposed to the world 
you know, and now we, we live in this world where there's a dichotomy between those who are okay with, you know, letting your child play in the dirt, get dirty, you know, be on the street. And those who are so worried about germs that they're using antiseptics and, and antibacterial soaps. And we know now that antibacterial soaps and antiseptics actually are going to have an effect on the gut microbiome in a negative way. So you do want that education to happen. So by the age of five, the microbiome has matured and has now started looking more like the adult microbiome. Now you ask, what are the things that affect that microbiome as we age? I mean, the number one thing that's going to affect that is antibiotics, mm -hmm. right? Antibiotics are the number one gut disruptor that destroys good bacteria along with bad bacteria. And it's going, and I'll, let me just give you an example. A woman has a UTI. She goes into her doctor. He gives her one of the most common antibiotics prescribed for UTIs, Cipro. Five day course. It's not a long course of antibiotics. Maybe they give her a uh, Levoquin, so uh, in the fluoroquinolone family. It will take the gut, and they've done studies on this, 12 months to recover from one five day course of Cipro. Wow. Now, say you go into your doctor and you have a viral infection and you've got an upper respiratory infection, and you go into your doctor, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard this Doc, can you just give me an antibiotic to wipe this out? Yeah. As a doctor, you know, probably this person just has a viral infection. They do not need an antibiotic, but you know, maybe you're pressured. Maybe you think maybe there could be like some uh, cross, maybe there's a co-infection with bacterial um, bronchitis. You give them a Z pack. Again, five days of antibiotics doesn't sound like a lot. Although z -Pak has a very long half-life, so it actually stays in your body for another five days. So five days becomes 10 days. And it takes the, the gut microbiome six months to recover from that. So it's not benign. So all of these things are little hits that cause changes in the microbiome that then if you insert processed food diet, um, alcohol. We don't think about this, but we use rubbing alcohol to sterilize surfaces. Mm. Well, alcohol in drinks is going to sterilize your gut. It actually does affect the gut microbiome and also can lead to leaky gut. So if you're drinking a lot, then you might um, have effects from that. Now let's fast forward to menopausal woman. So Typically, you know, I'm just, I'm going to just kind of stereotype because there could be, you know, not everyone's married, but typically a woman going through menopause, late forties, early fifties has kids. The kids are teenagers. Teenagers are stressful. <laughs> Your hormones are like going up and down, which even just hormone fluctuations are going to affect the makeup of the microbiome because the microbiome is responding even to estrogen. There's a part of the microbiome that's called the estrobilome that is metabolizing both your estrogen and also xenoestrogens, estrogens that we're exposed to through the environment, through environmental chemicals. And so now you're stressed, you're, you know, you're maybe in a stage in your career where you've, you've gotten to a higher level in the company and that's also causing stress. There might be some marital distress. Also the kids are rowdy. And stress is also a gut disruptor that alters the microbiome and it's going to shift that microbiome into a microbiome that promotes things like insulin resistance. So you start gaining weight and you think it's the menopause, you're not thinking about the stress. Maybe the glass of wine you have every night because you now, once the kids are asleep, well, maybe teenagers not because they stay up till me. I have a teenager, so I know they... They, he stays up later than I do. Um, but maybe you need that glass of wine at night to de-stress. That's affecting your gut microbiome. And we know also from studies that have been done at looking at the senescent microbiome and also looking at the microbiome of centenarians, like that, you know, people who live past the age of 100. And is there something special about their microbiome that's different? from the microbiome of people who don't live into their 
you know, past their 80s, 90s, into their hundreds. And we do know that the microbiome as we age starts to shift. And, and one of the reasons that they think that aging might happen is because the microbiome starts to drift in the direction of a more inflammatory microbiome. And yet what we find in centenarians is that there are elements of their microbiome that actually stay that control inflammation. So they seem to have a better ability to control inflammation, to fight off infection than those that don't, aren't able to live that long. And there are also effects of commingling. So if you look at where centenarians live, a lot of them live in multi-generational households where you're kind of like commingling by touching and whatnot, microbiome between the younger kids and, and the adults and their grandparents. And that might also have some sort of effect that allows the grandparents' microbiome to stay a little bit younger, which then keeps them younger. Um, so our microbiome is shifting all the time based on environmental inputs, based on um, medications that we're exposed to, even over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, which maybe as you go into menopause, um, things start to get a little more inflamed, your joints ache, you're working yeah. out, you tend to get injured more easily. So then you're taking ibuprofen or even Tylenol. And we know now studies have shown that ibuprofen increases uh, gut permeability, but it also is going to alter the gut microbiome. Now we used to think that Tylenol was neutral for the gut, like it's not gonna cause any problems. And now we've learned that acetaminophen can actually cause changes in the microbiome that then lead to leaky gut. Interesting. So, so you have to think, you know, there are a lot of things, there are a lot of factors that people could be exposed to. And a lot of them are over the counter that, you know, you take and you think, well, it's safe because it's over the counter. It's not yeah. gonna, not gonna cause any problems in my body. And yet these, these medications can have serious um, issues if you take them for a long time, including, um, I, you know, ibuprofen causing a stomach ulcer. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm a geriatric physical therapist. So I'm thinking about all those older adults going on antibiotics often for pneumonia um, and then how that could be affecting them and coming in with poor baseline. And, yeah. And I also want to mention, you know, women going through menopause, you know, their, their estrogen is dropping. So now their vaginal canal is not as estrogenized, not as moist. So then they become more prone to getting UTIs suddenly okay. yeah. from, from having intercourse. And then they might end up on antibiotics because of that. So, you know, there are a lot of factors that then um, equal changes in the microbiome that can lead to insulin resistance, to weight gain, to all sorts of um, changes, effects on the gut brain access. Yeah. And I want to get to the gut brain connection, but before we do that, I thought it would be wise to talk about food sensitivities and food intolerances. Can you first explain the difference and then explain what your favorite tests or your go-to tests are? Because there's so many on the market and it's hard to know which ones have been validated and approved. Yeah, exactly. And, and I want to add to this food allergies because that's kind of the more yeah. classic thing that we, we think of. Yep. Um, yep. And, you know, as parents, if you have a child that has a peanut allergy, a nut allergy, you know, it's very important that when they go to school that they know that because these allergies act really fast. They're mediated by IgE antibodies that only have about a two and a half day half life, but they can they go into effect really quickly, trigger a mast cell response that can close the airway. So this can be really dangerous. And that's what we think of as when we think of, you know, cause a lot of people will interchangeably say, well, I have a food sensitivity and they think it's a food allergy, but it's not the same thing. Yep. You know, food allergy can also trigger some sort of rash, hives, you know, big reaction very quickly. Food sensitivity, on the other hand, is mediated by a different type of antibody that is found in the bloodstream, it's IgGs. And food sensitivities can really only happen if you have leaky gut and you're getting partially digested proteins from those foods that get absorbed into the bloodstream and so, you know, if, 
if the bloodstream, if, if our uh, immune cells, and again, I, I said like 70 to 80% of the immune system is all along the gut lining. Part of what it's doing is it's our border patrol. And there are gates and, you know, that checks and balances. And there are gates where the white blood cells known as dendritic cells are kind of crawling around and they're checking what's coming in, you know, what's, what's getting through this barrier. So say you now, you've been on antibiotics, you, you're stressed, uh, you're drinking a lot of alcohol, you've got leaky gut, and over time, you can start to develop a food sensitivity because, say, partially digested part of soy gets in your bloodstream, and your white blood cell doesn't recognize it, says, this looks like a virus, or this looks like a part of the bacteria, I don't know what this is, yeah. presents it to the other to the T cells, the B cells, and you start forming antibodies. And this is how you get a food sensitivity. So you get antibodies in the bloodstream that react to these foods. The, the difference to understand between food sensitivity and food allergy is that food allergy is immediate, food sensitivity is slow. So food sensitivity could happen, yes, within a couple of minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, it could be two hours, it could be several hours, it could be 12 hours later when you're starting to feel the effects of having eaten that food. And it can go up to 36, even 72 hours after eating the food. The more you expose yourself, the more you're driving that system. So I said IgE antibodies have a half-life about two and a half, three days. IgG antibodies have a half-life of 21 days. And half-life just means that if there are, I'm just gonna use a random number, if there are 100 IgG antibody molecules that look like these little goal posts swimming around in your bloodstream, it takes 50 days for half of those to be removed. So that's a half-life. It's how long it takes for, for the, um, the amount of antibodies to be reduced. So one is fast, the other one is slow. They all, they both involve allergy sensitivity, involve the immune system. Now, if we go into an intolerance, intolerance is a local event that happens inside the gut that has nothing to do with getting into the bloodstream. Okay. So when you're intolerant to a food, it could be that you're lacking lactase enzyme to break down the lactose sugar in dairy. It could be that you're not breaking down the fructans, which is another type of carbohydrate sugar in wheat and other foods. And so then they get fermented by the gut bacteria and they make you uncomfortable. They got cause gas, bloating, constipation, or even diarrhea. So it's a very different picture. It's a local wow. phenomenon that is probably happening because of leaky gut, pancreatic insufficiency, lack of stomach acid, not making enough digestive enzymes. So now you're intolerant to the food because it's like what we call you know, dairy intolerance or lactose intolerance. You, the person who's lactose intolerant knows if you drank a glass of milk an hour later or even sooner, you're going to be running to the bathroom with diarrhea. Or if you have a soup with cream, like a patient of mine was uh, doing recently, she's like, I don't know what's going on. Um, she lives in an assisted living facility and she goes to the dining hall and they had this soup. And within 10 minutes of eating the soup, she had to just run, jet off to the bathroom and we were trying to figure out, and, and what we found out was the soup had cream in it and she's lactose intolerant. So that's what happens. So you don't see a body-wide immunological effect with intolerances. You see a gut-related, gut-centric effect, whereas allergies and, and sensitivities, you see some effects that can happen throughout the body. And what we found is that there are connections between food sensitivities and migraines. So if you're Food, if you're sensitive to foods, they can trigger a migraine for you. And um, food sensitivities can lead to all sorts of other um, immunological issues, hives, uh, skin rashes, eczema, psoriasis, headaches, mental fog, all these things could be signs wow. of food sensitivities. So they, so they create slightly different effects, but... Um, hopefully that clarifies it. I'm so glad that you went into that. Yeah. I thought that was really, really helpful. Um, it's, all, it's also really important to understand that testing for food allergies through IgE is very well standardized 
and it's standardized across all labs. Okay. So it's it's repeatable, and if you send the blood sample to different labs, you're going to get the same results. Is it not Where, the same for sensitivity, I'm guessing? For sensitivities, it's not the same. There are many different ways to test for sensitivities. You can test for IgG. You can test for IgG type 4, which is maybe a little more specific. And you can even go one more step and look at whether the person is reacting to IgG4 and does that IgG4 activate the complement system? And if it's and that was the test that I did back when I found out that I was gluten sensitive, I did an IgG type four test with complement activation. And the complement activation kind of is an extra step that tells you, okay, this person is lighting up with IgG four. Is it significant? Is it enough to light up complement? And if it does, then you think, okay, this is a true sensitivity because as I said, it's not standardized in the same way and you can get false positives. What I tell people to understand the difference between a food allergy test and a food sensitivity test, food allergy test is like an iPhone 14, like crystal clear. You're going to get a very clear picture of what's happening. A food sensitivity test is a Monet painting. You might know you're looking at Big Ben or you're looking at water lilies, but they're blurry. So yeah. it's just giving you kind of, it's giving you a direction. And I find them to be really useful with people who aren't being 100% dedicated to a, an elimination diet, who maybe need to just see it on paper. Like, look at what happens when you eat these foods, your body is reacting in this way. It's activating your immune system. Now, do I need a food sensitivity test to tell me that? Not really, because a lot of this you can learn just by filtering down and being really specific with the story that the patient's telling you, or even how they feel when they eat certain foods. And ultimately, you know, that kind of leads me to the gold standard, which is really taking the foods out and then for at least a period of four weeks. Okay. Two weeks is, is a little bit, though my, my new plan is a 14-day protocol, but it's repeatable every 14 days. But the reason for four weeks is remember again, it's the IgGs have a half-life of 21 days. So typically you would see elimination diets that go for 21 days. But when I was doing that with patients, I found that actually four weeks, like doing one extra week actually gets them, helps them cool off the inflammation enough so that when you reintroduce the food, you're looking for, again, you you have to become really intuitive, aware, like, like really body sensitive, like listening to your body and look for some unusual reaction that wasn't there before. Yeah. You know, so maybe you, you have a sip of a beer and suddenly you get congested here. You feel some pressure in your face. That's wheat sensitivity. Hmm. I know my son is uh four and a half and he's always had skin issues. Like and not bad. Um, but I think there's a lot of kids with almost like eczema type things, like some red patches. We've never tried in an elimination diet because it hasn't been that bad, but I'm almost getting to the point where I'm like, why not try a little bit? So would you suggest that I start with dairy or gluten? Like what's the more common, uh, food sensitivity that you see in children? Those are the two top two. And the thing is that what I will tell you is that we understand the mechanism of gluten. So gluten triggers the release of zonulin in the cells that line the intestines. And zonulin controls gut permeability. So every cell that lines the intestine is connected to the next cell through this kind of Velcro-like network called tight junctions. And they keep the cells really tight. So there's no leaks in between where molecules can get in like partially digested proteins. Mm -hmm. So, but when you're exposed to wheat and this, they've done studies where they've looked at normal people, people with celiac, which is an autoimmune intolerance to wheat and people who are in between, they call them non-celiac gluten sensitive. So they're not autoimmune, but they're still sensitive to gluten. And they found that even normal people have a certain increase in gut permeability with wheat. So, you know, the best thing to do 
would be to do both of them, wheat and dairy. Okay. And then do a test several weeks in, you know, whenever four weeks, six weeks, and, but you only test one at a time. So whenever you're testing a food, you're not going to test wheat and dairy on the same day. You're only going to test wheat when you're reintroducing it, or you're only going to test dairy. And I, can I share a quick story? Absolutely. Yeah. So my son is five years old, many years ago. Oh, I was like, now he's a teenager. He's now now a, a, a 18 year old in college. So he, we're go, he's five years old. We're changing schools. He goes to new school for kindergarten and we're packing, you know, we're, we weren't hundred percent gluten-free household yet. So some days we were packing sandwiches for lunch and he starts acting out in a way that he's never acted out before. And the teacher's having disciplinary problems with our son. And we're like, this is not our son. Like he never behaved this way. And I started wondering, like, you know, is he hungry? Do you think maybe we're not feeding him enough breakfast? And I asked the teacher, you know, is this happening before lunch? Is this happening after lunch? She couldn't help. She's like, I don't know. It's like, you know, he was butting heads with the teacher, you know, just having meltdowns. And knowing what gluten can do to the brain, because gluten actually acts as a neurotoxin, Hmm. We decided that, and also knowing that I had tested positive. So knowing, okay, I'm, I know I have a wheat sensitivity. Maybe he also has the same sensitivity. We decided overnight, we're taking wheat out of his diet. We are now going to become a hundred percent gluten-free household, change his diet, change what we were packing for lunch. By the end of the first week, his behavior had turned around. And by two weeks, he's not having any tantrums. He's listening to the teacher, complete turnaround in his personality. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that is sometimes the dramatic things you can see with an elimination diet. And obviously with children, you know, you're going to see results really quickly with adults. They've accumulated so many more things that sometimes the results take a little bit longer to, to notice. Like for me, it took me two weeks to notice that there was a difference because I had taken gluten out. And that's how, that's also really important for people to understand as adults that you might make a change in your diet. Don't expect immediate gratification. You've got to stick with it because if that food was activating your immune system, and if you have leaky gut, then it's going to take a bit of time for that to unravel and for all those inflammatory markers to start dropping And if let's say this is the threshold where your symptoms start to disappear, but you're up here and in one week you're here and in two weeks you're here, but you're still above that threshold. And in two and a half weeks, you hit the threshold and by three weeks, you're below the threshold. You're not going to see improvement until you get below that threshold. Yeah. So you might have to, you know, sometimes um, when I work with patients, you have to go with blind faith initially because you're not going to see the result, but you have to trust that what you're doing is creating an internal shift that is reversing the engines of inflammation, that when it goes down enough below that threshold, you're going to start seeing benefits. You know, your energy is going to improve, your brain function is going to improve, but you have to be willing to stick it out until you get to that point. Yeah. Thank you for that advice. Um, That's going to be a big shift in our household. Whenever we do that, we don't do a lot of gluten. We do a lot of like whole foods, I guess, but we do a lot of dairy still. Um, But I do want to try it. I think that that'd be wise to try it. And he starts kindergarten in August. And so it's just kind of that, that nice transition phase for him. Like, let's get this figured out. Um, My daughter, thankfully doesn't have any, uh, doesn't have any apparent uh, skin issues from food. So Um, the one, the one time that it does get bad for him is after processed food. So anytime he has like greasy pizza, anytime I'll let him have, um, any processed food, that's, I know when it lights up too. Um, what is it about the processed food or is it just like the gluten or the dairy in the processed food or is there something specific? Well, the other thing you have to think about in processed food is the sugar Yeah. and how sugar might be feeding the gut microbiome, whether it's bad bugs in the gut or whether it's yeast overgrowth in the gut that 
scrambles the immune system and is causing all sorts of reactions in the body. So you always have to think about that with um, processed foods is that you have another element there that people, you don't necessarily become, you don't develop a food sensitivity to sugar because sugar is such a small molecule. Your immune system is not going to react to it, but sugar is a molecule that your gut microbiome and bad bugs and yeast in the gut love to gobble, gobble up. And if it's yeast, it's producing mycotoxins that then are scrambling your immune system and um, affecting your brain and other things. Um, and if it's bad bugs, they are also going to um, possibly produce postbiotic products that are inflammatory. Um, and there's also endotoxin that can be released from bacteria in the gut. That is one of the most potent stimulators of the immune system. Interesting. Well, thanks for that advice. Um, I think that that's a kind of a nice place to shift into the gut brain connection, especially with the story about your son and um, the behavioral things that you guys saw lifted after removing. I, gluten. And, and if I can like add one piece to that story. So yeah. fast forward um, three months later. So it's Christmas time. We flew down to meet the family and they decide they want to go to a pizza restaurant. And I'm kind of like, mm, I don't know. Um, and they give my son pizza. And, and I am always try to be the, the even, you know, I, I try not to be orthorexic. Like I try to think like, okay, he's a kid. Like, let's not be so strict. Like we're out with family. He had a slice of pizza and his eyes glazed over and he started acting as if he had had a drink of alcohol. Mm. Interesting. And, I looked at his mom and I said, you see this? Like he hasn't had gluten for three months and look at what it just did. This is not good for him. And sometimes you need that confirmation, you know, and I think it's important also, you know, whether you're a parent or you're an adult and you're trying to make a dietary change and, and then you do a misstep and you don't feel well. And a lot of people, when that happens is they throw in the towel and they're like, oh, yeah forget it. I'm just going to do this. Yeah. I'm just going to go back to these things. And you've got to be able to have some love, compassion and say, okay, I did this, but tomorrow I'm, I'm going to get back to where I was because you have to remember the process. It takes a bit. And the thing is, if you're really gluten sensitive, each time you have gluten, it's you're setting the clock back. You're kind of pushing yourself back. You have to then go through the process again to um, get back to where you were. But what I what I can say, having worked with um, so many patients over the years, is that as you heal the gut, the more healed the gut, the better, the more um, healed and diverse the microbiome is. If you have a misstep, the re be, the recovery period is much faster. Yeah, good. You're able to get back to normal much faster. Can you tolerate certain foods again too? Like if someone has an egg sensitivity. Um, or an egg intolerance, can they can they tolerate it better, you know, in a few months? As as you heal the gut, yeah, you can mm -hmm. you can definitely improve your tolerance. And sometimes you can actually bring some foods back. And again, I love talking about these threshold yeah. issues. And I talk about this in my book, Gut Smart, um, a lot about intuitive eating and and having before, during, and after meal intuition. And the after meal intuition is recognizing did this sit okay? Because yeah. eggs might not sit okay. And what might happen is you feel nauseous. You feel like a light nausea after eating. That could be a sign of a food sensitivity. And that's all you're, you're getting is a little bit of nausea. But there's also the threshold. So same way that I was talking about the threshold in the other direction, um, when you're introducing a food, if you cross a certain threshold, maybe it starts having effects again. But if you're below the threshold and you only have a certain amount once a week, whatever it is, then you're okay. But if you cross the threshold, then you don't feel so okay. And honestly, over time, that might just take some self-experimentation and seeing yeah. what happens if I have it once a week? What happens if I have it twice a week? What happens if I increase that to three times a week? And then you cross the threshold and you know, okay, this is this is my level. I can I can have eggs once a week. I'm okay, but more than that, it's it's going to start bringing up my eczema. It's going to make me not feel so good. Good. Okay. So Thanks it's very that, individualized, guys. and that's, yeah. that's something that I really emphasize is you know how how can people become their own guru, doctor guru? Like 
be the doctor of your own body because you know your body best. You know it better than anybody else. Yes. I was just going to say that everyone is so different. That's why when someone's like, do you have any meal plans? I'm like, no, because every meal, everyone's meal plan needs to be different and tailored to them. And um, so I, I think that they can, they can serve as a good structure and a good, like kind of starting place, but they always have to be individualized. Um, so I think that's kind of the benefit of the meal plan. If you want to learn the, the basic structure, but know that um, you, any, any meal plan that you get will probably have to be tailored to you at some point. And, and, and that's why yeah. that was really the inspiration for my second book is realizing that no two guts are the same. Mm -hmm. So their diets can't be the same. And I wanted to personalize it. And I did that using a quiz that lets you know if you're mild, moderate, or severe. And then based on your score, not only can you track your progress, but you know what foods you can eat and what foods you can't eat. And I created these very long food lists. I teamed up with nutritionists, a fermentationist, and was able to create these really long food lists along with a meal plan and recipes. But I also wanted the food list because I want people to know, okay, if they're in the supermarket and you're severe, these are the foods that are okay for you to eat. These are what the ones that are not okay. Right. And then you have to kind of become like, you have to test and see, you know, is this right for me? Is this wrong for me? I always say that's why we call it practicing medicine is... It, like you said, there's the science, but there's also the art and then everyone has to become their own best advocate. So um, thanks for sharing that. And um, I hope that if people are struggling with, with this, they check your book out and check the quiz out and kind of use that resource because I know probably so much time and thought and experience went into that. I've never written a book, but I've spoken to a lot of authors and I know, I know it's a labor of love. Um, I will so say, I will say writing a book is difficult. Yeah. Um, writing a one size fits all book is much easier than writing a book that has three different possibilities yeah. Yeah, for people. Like but I felt it was really important to personalize it, um, which there are not that many books out there that do that. Yeah. But I yeah. think, you know, it, everybody's an individual and people react differently to foods. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for doing that. Thanks for creating that resource. Um, let's wrap up this interview. We have about 10 minutes left with that conversation on the gut brain connection. So I'm going to just give the mic to you and let, and I want you to just explain physiologically, how is the gut and the brain connected and why do so many people experience symptoms of anxiety um, and depression and brain fog if they don't have their gut health dialed in? Yeah. Yeah. I want to start by talking about the vagus nerve and it's this long wired nerve that goes from the brain stem all the way down through all the internal organs. So it wires the lungs, the heart and the digestive system. And if you think back to, I don't know how old your audience is, but I know you you said you, you work with geriatrics. So your older patients will remember when we still had wired phones, not cell phones. And when you picked up the phone, the first thing you heard was a dial tone and it was kind of like a sound like, and you knew that the phone is working. And if you pick up the phone and there's no dial tone, the phone is dead. Well, there's something that we call vagal tone. Vagal tone is very important. It's kind of like the dial tone between in your vagus that connects your brain to your gut and vice versa. And it's a two-way street. But the important thing to realize is that about 80% of the neurons inside the vagus are actually pointing from the gut up to the brain. Mm -hmm. So the majority of communication is actually upstream rather than downstream, but both directions are super important. We talked about leaky gut when the gut becomes more permeable. That's what made me sick, caused food sensitivities. And that's what um, probably the majority of people on this planet are walking around with a certain level of leaky gut. Well, the brain controls gut permeability through the vagus nerve. So that vagal tone is very important for controlling how permeable your gut is. So if you have low vagal tone, which happens, for example, when you're really stressed, your vagal tone is gonna drop. And, and how do you know this? So, I, so I, wanna, I always like to relate it to things that everybody feels. So when you've ever been really stressed that you feel like you have a knot in your stomach mm -hmm. or you feel like you're not hungry, you lose your appetite, or when you eat, you feel like the food just sits in your stomach like a brick. It's like not moving. When that happens, that's 
basically your vagal tone has dropped. You're not getting that signaling to the stomach, which is telling the stomach, make stomach acid, make digestive enzymes, break down food, and then the signaling to the gut, to the, the rhythmic contractions of the gut to move the food down. So the food just sits there. So stress, I would say, is the number one reason we lose vagal tone. Now, looking at it from the other direction, the vagus has all of these little sensors in the, the junctions with the gut that are sensing molecules that are being created either by the and uh, they call them enteroendocrine cells that line the gut, but also the gut microbiome. And a lot of those nerve endings have 5-HT receptors. And what that means is that they sense serotonin or happiness molecule, but a lot of that serotonin is not being made in the brain, it's actually being made in the gut. And when those receptors get serotonin, it triggers a nerve response that goes up to your brain and then that vagus splits into different regions of the brain. And one of the things that it does is it releases GABA, which is a neurotransmitter that's telling your brain, shh, like, calm down, like, shush, everybody, chill out, everything's good. So it's kind of giving your brain a read of what's happening out in the periphery. Um, and it's also really important because, you know, our enteric nervous system actually has more nerve endings than our brain. And so we talk about things like gut instincts, like I felt it in my yeah. gut. And it's because your gut actually is digesting information that is coming energetically at you, emotions, things like that are being felt in the gut. And that's why when you're, you have a really bad argument, you kind of feel it in your stomach. Or if you're nervous about something, you might have to run to the bathroom. You know, it's very common in kids um, and even adults. And so that those neurotransmitters that are being created, not just by your enter enteroendocrine cells, but also by your gut microbiome are signaling the brain through the vagus, telling the brain the status of the gut, but also helping to keep that vagal tone alive, which is really important for the functioning of the entire system. And those are just some of the ways that we understand. So that's the, the neurological connection between the gut and the brain. Then we've got postbiotic nutrients. So like short chain fatty acids, like butyrate, for example. And what these do is they cross the gut barrier and they enter your circulation and they can cross the, the blood brain barrier. And when they go into the brain, they actually have an epigenetic effect. Hmm. So I really want to like get this into people's minds because you have to think your gut microbiome is gobbling up fibers from vegetables that you eat, which is why it's important to eat fiber along with fermented foods also because of something called cross-feeding where the microbiome supports other strains of bacteria produce postbiotics that support other bacteria. And those postbiotic nutrients like butyrate get into your bloodstream, cross the blood-brain barrier, get into your brain, and they have epigenetic effect where they increase BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which helps you create new neural connections helps you form memories, helps you learn new things. So your gut microbiome is controlling in part your ability to learn. And this is happening later in life. I do not believe the saying that you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. I think you can teach anybody new things, even elderly patients. I've had older patients who learn new things. But the reason probably that that saying came about is what I talked about earlier is that as we get older, the microbiome shifts into a more inflammatory, inflammation provoking right. microbiome. But if you can support the diversity of that microbiome, which uh, there was a study that came out uh, by Stanford University in, at the end of 2021 that found that a high fermented foods diet actually helps improve microbiome diversity more than a fiber-rich diet. Interesting. Now they're both important because yeah. fiber through its effects on the microbiome modulates how the immune system behaves and our immune system needs to be regulated or else it goes haywire, you know? So you want your immune system to, to be active enough, but you don't want it to be overactive. And all these things affect the brain because if you have a fire going on in your belly, you know, a chronically activated immune system with leaky gut, your blood brain barrier becomes leaky. 
And as a result, more inflammatory molecules can enter the brain. And when the brain gets inflamed, what you might be feeling is anxious or depressed. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we know, um, speaking of um, anxiety, is that certain strains of lactobacilli in the gut actually produce GABA. So that same inhibitory neurotransmitter that I talked about that is released by the vagus in the brain in response to serotonin being released in the gut. But we also have GABA produced by lactobacillus. And they did a study in, in the UK where they had women drink a um, kefir beverage. So it's a fermented dairy beverage, kind of like a fermented yogurt that um, they drank every day. And they did a pre, before this study, they looked at their anxiety scores through a questionnaire. And at two weeks, they had them fill out the same questionnaire and their anxiety scores had dropped just by having that kefir beverage, which helps support more lactobacilli in the gut, which are producing GABA. GABA. So there are a lot of, you know, metabolic connections, um, you know, endocrine connections, neurotransmitter connections, neurological connections between the gut and the brain that were underappreciated before this time. And anybody who's suffering from mental health issues, from anxiety, there's so many people who suffer from depression and are taking antidepressants who are not really addressing the root of the matter, which is the gut. You've mm -hmm. got to look at the gut. If you have a mental health issues, you also have to look into the state of your gut and the gut microbiome and things you could do to help better it. Yeah. Well, and I know that we just scratched the surface today, but I want to respect your time and um, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise. I know we probably could have talked a whole nother hour um, about that gut brain totally. connection, but at least we introduced the topic to people today. Um, I hope if you're struggling with anxiety or depression, that you really look into that and um, do your due diligent research on how you can improve that. I know your book would be a great resource for that. Um, can you tell people where they can purchase your books and where they can learn more about you? Yeah, you can find my book at gutsmartprotocol.com. And you um, actually, for your listeners, I have a free gift, which is a download of a free chapter from my nice. book, uh, as well as some little surprises in there. If you go to gutsmartprotocol.com forward slash gift, I'm sure you'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, sure. Um, they can, everyone can download a free chapter from my book. And if they go to gutsmartprotocol.com, and pre-order the book, you'll be able to get five special bonuses, including a gift card. Um, so um, it's it, it sure you could go to Amazon, you can go to Barnes and Noble, but if you come come through gutsmartprotocol.com, you'll be able to also get special bonuses that um, can get you started and learning how to take care of your gut better. Wonderful. And then did you have any other website that you wanted to share today besides the gutsmartprotocol.com? Um, my other website is the the website that supports uh, the programs and products that I created for Happy Gut, uh, which is happygutlife.com. And that's based on my first book, Happy Gut. And it's got a whole bunch of more in-depth uh, programs and, and products that can help people in their gut healing journey. Good. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pedre. It was a, it was a delight talking to you today. Um, and I hope that your new book just does great. It sounds like an excellent resource. Um, thanks again for your expertise and your time. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks for having me.